Oh, 
Heavenly Father, to know you is to love you because you are so magnificent. You're perfect, powerful, wonderful in all ways. And we want to know you more. Holy Spirit, give us new understanding today how to walk in your favor because our heart's desire is to bring the kingdom of heaven here to the earth. We ask you for this in your precious, precious name. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I was praying, I always pray when every week I, I say, God, what do you want me to teach? And then sometimes, I, I love it. I get something that I study and then I come here and then I hear that someone else somewhere was preaching the identical same thing. And it just makes me know that the Holy Spirit is the same no matter where you are. And it just gets me so excited. So this week as I was praying, I knew I had to connect something with Mother's Day. That's what pastors do. They get something about Mother's Day. So I prayed and God started speaking to me about teaching about a mother in the Bible that we actually know more about than any other woman in the Bible. But I have to tell you something. The Holy Spirit's prompting me right now to do something else. And you know what? I hate to tell you this, but it's his service. Amen. So I'm going to give this microphone to somebody. You know, if we need the red mic on. As I pray every Sunday a blessing over you, I don't know if you realize what that means. You know, at the end of the service, I bless you. I put the protection of God over you every Sunday morning when you leave. And that goes for you people who are listening to this service on the Internet. There's something when the man or woman of God blesses you that goes home with you. Ron, would you come up here? Because Ron had a situation this week. I asked him if he would share this. I want you to know the same blessing that stands on this man because he comes Sunday after Sunday and receives that protection is upon you. He had a crazy incident this week, but he had an even better miracle. Ron, would you just tell us what happened? Yeah, uh, I was on my way to the dentist, uh, going down Church Road, and... uh, it's just before you get to Heidelberg Heights Road, the turn off there. There's a real sharp turn, and it was raining. The road was wet, and an oil slick collects up that part of the road. So as I navigated the turn, my car slid off the road, and there's a picket. There's a fence, a farm fence, a long fence, maybe 200 foot long. It's made out of two by fours, and there's two of them. It's maybe four foot off the ground. The car slid off the road and went dead center into the fence on the driver's side. Well, that was no problem, but the two-by-four splintered up and came through the windshield, an eight-foot length of two-by-four. Right next it, to it. It missed my head by about a quarter of an inch. And there's a square hole in the windshield the side of the two-by-four. Let me tell you, blessings. And that's that's yeah. really all there is to say. I mean, you know, just another, another example of, you know, is there guardian angels? You know, what is it? But anyway... Somebody was looking out for me, that's for sure. And we know who that somebody was. (laughs) Hallelujah. You know, I I wanted him to tell you that because I want you to write these things down, what God's doing in your life. You know, I don't know why we have such short memories when it comes to God. You know, somebody offends us and we remember it for 25 years. And God blesses us and we forget it in two months. Write these things down. You know, you know, somebody tells me a story like that, it's not a coincidence. You know, I, I just believe that there's uh, uh, angels, there's Holy Spirit's protecting us, keeping us, holding us. And I, I wanted you to hear that beautiful testimony because Ron's here with us this morning. He's not in the hospital and he's not somewhere in a casket. He's sitting with us because of the blessings that he receives here Sunday mornings. I just thank you for it, God. So let's get back to this lady in the Bible that we know this much about. You know, this morning, uh, Joy picked some beautiful songs, and as she was singing and teaching us these new songs, I couldn't help but think 
But I want you to see Mary different this morning. You know, Mary is the mother of Jesus. And we know more about her than any other woman in the Bible. Oh, yes, there's a book about Esther. There's a book about Ruth. But you don't know the whole story of Mary like we know about Mary, Jesus' mom. You know that she was written about in the New Testament more than any other woman? Think about it. You know, many of us have been raised in, in a background or a religion maybe that has put Mary on a pedestal. And I'm here to tell you this morning, she's a beautiful woman, but she was a real human being, just like every lady sitting in this room. She wasn't special, except she was. I want you to hear that from my heart. Because, you know, we know her husband. We know she was engaged to Joseph. And this morning, I want you all, I know this, guys, is a little bit difficult for you, but I want you to see this word from Mary's point of view, from a mom's point of view. I know, ladies, that won't be so difficult for you, but maybe, guys, think about being a dad from a mom's perspective. You know, mom cries quicker, often, not always. <laughs> I got Joel here. <laughs> Everybody's different. <laughs> but we know that she had relatives, Elizabeth and Zachariah. We know the story that she went to see her cousin Elizabeth when Elizabeth was pregnant. How many of you remember she was a songwriter? She wrote a song. You know, she wasn't a prince or a uh, Taylor Swift or whatever those movie singers today, but she wrote a song and you can find it in, in the book of Luke. It's uh, chapter 1, 46 to 55. Read her song. She was a songwriter. Maybe if she would have had her own producer, she would be popular as a song singer. We know she got pregnant when she was only engaged and had never had relations with a man. But do you ever think about how that pregnancy turned her life upside down? Here was a young girl planning her wedding day, all of the hoopla that we do in in a Jewish wedding with, with the great stuff and the mothers and the fathers and the families and they, they celebrate for a week and she's got this all ready planned and her life gets turned upside down. You know what I said earlier, life happens while you're making plans? She's pregnant. Now what does she do? She's just about like an outcast in her society. We know that Joseph accepted because of the angel what God was doing and took her. They got married. We know that she traveled from Nazareth to the hill country. Now think about this. Not in an SUV over those rough terrains. Not in a uh, fancy car or a train or even flying, she went by foot from Nazareth to the hill country to see Elizabeth. We know she got on a donkey and went from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and then she went to Egypt. You know, she was a world traveler in those days because she went all to these different places. Many of you haven't been too far out of Pennsylvania, and this woman was all over the country of Israel. She was a pretty brave lady. Remember, she was about 15 or 16 years old. She was very young. We know that she dedicated her son Jesus in the temple when he was eight days old. And again, when he was 12 years old, they were back at the feasts. We know those stories. And did you ever think about it? She was a widow at a very young age. Life happens while you're making plans. We know that she believed in the angel. We know that she was the one who encouraged Jesus to do his first miracle. Remember? See, she was a pretty brave, strong woman. I would call it that she had some chutzpah. I don't think she was a sit-at-home, twiddle-your-thumbs kind of mom. I think she was very interactive. I think she taught Jesus who he was. She told him about that morning that the angel came. She was special. You know, Jesus was a real man, just like Mary was a real woman. These aren't stories. This is history. This is really things that happened. We know that one time in the Bible, 
And I, all of these stories, you can find them in the book. That one time, Jesus' brothers and her came down from Nazareth to Capernaum to talk to Jesus because the word got home that this guy's going off the track here. Remember? They came to say, what's going on? She brought her, her other sons. And we know from the book that she stood there and watched her son being crucified. You know, as we're singing those songs this morning, Joy, I just couldn't help but see that picture. Mother's Day, thinking about a mom standing there watching this, thinking about, you know, moms do this, guys, so bear with me, thinking about the first day you hold that baby in your arms and then how you scold them when they're teenagers. And then how you pray for them when they're 14, 15, 16 and pray that they'll make it. See, that's what moms do. That's what Mary did. And then here's her son, 30-some years old, and she's standing at the cross and going, God, I don't get this. Remember, they didn't really understand the resurrection until it happened. Seeing her son being punished on the cross, seeing them do those awful things, And then Jesus, don't you just love this part, when he says to John standing next to Mary, Son, behold your mother. What a story for Mother's Day. Mother, he's going to take care of you. She had other sons, but don't forget, a Jewish family. She was raised a Jewish family. Family is so important. The oldest son becomes the father of the family. When the father dies, I told you she was a widow, young. So Jesus took on that role. Now he's on the cross. He's still responsible to take care of his mom. And he stands there and he says, on the cross, he looks down. He's beaten. He's bleeding. He's in pain. And he's thinking about mom. John, you got to take care of mom. Now let me tell you why he didn't say that to his brothers. Because you got to know the rest of the story. Mary had two other boys. Well, she had several other sons. She actually had four boys and several girls. Two of his brothers, James, after Jesus was resurrected, became a leader of the Christian church. He was the, uh, the leader, the head of the synagogue in Jerusalem. But he was martyred and killed his brother Jude wrote the book of Jude by the way James the book of James is written by Jesus brother James you can, this is all history you can read these things his brother Jude was also martyred you see John the one Jesus said take care of mom lived to be in the 90s and Jesus already knew that he would be around for his mother's whole life the brothers only lived a couple years later, maybe 20 years. She lived, the, word, the history books say, because it's not in the Bible, and I really tried to find this, that she lived somewhere to the age of 59. Pretty old for those days. And she was taken care of by John, who ended up being in the 90s age-wise. You know, Joel and I were in uh, Ephesus, actually. History says this, and there's a lot of stories in history about Mary. Some some. Places and churches even teach that she never died, but that's not true. She was a real woman. She died just like you and I do. But the history says that John built her home in Ephesus, where one of the first churches was. And Joel and I, do you remember that? We were on a trip with Pastor Benny, and we were touring some of the the countries of the Mediterranean, and we ended up in Ephesus, which was one of the places, if you don't get to Jerusalem or Israel, you got to go to Ephesus. There's so much history there. But we went to this place, and you walk up this long road, and you come on top of this hill, and there's this house that's been restored that they teach you. Like, you know, have to understand, this is 2,000 years ago, so you're not absolutely sure if this is the spot. But they say this is where Mary lived. It was just a very plain house. But there was, interestingly, a feeling in that house of love. I remember that. I remember that, and this might be seven, eight years ago. But I walked in there, and I go like, wow. Something outside said, this is Mary's house. It felt like a home of love. And I thought, of all people that the love of God would be on is the mother of Jesus that brought him to the earth. 
So we went there, and it was on a hill. And you know, remember, she lived in a village. She wasn't much for the big cities. She only went to Jerusalem when she had to. So here she was living in seclusion on this hill near Ephesus, which was a pretty large city. I think that's one of the reasons I think John is one of my favorite apostles is because I remember how he took Mary and cared for her all the days of her life. You know, John is not one of those who you read about traveling as much as Peter and all the other apostles and, and Paul and all those things. But, P, but John stayed and took care of Mary. And that's why Jesus picked him at the cross. I want to go um, and read um, the last time Mary's name shows up in the Bible is in Acts. The first chapter, 12 to 14. See now, Jesus has died. He went out into the mountain and he was ascended. Ascension day, 40 days after the resurrection. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Can you imagine what was on a mother's heart that day? She saw the cross. She saw the empty tomb. She was with him for 40 days. And now it's time for him to go back to heaven. You know, from a mother's heart, you've got this mixed emotion of, wow, this is unbelievable, to, whoa, I really don't miss my son. That's what goes, the emotions that go through a woman's heart. So now they just came back. Jesus has ascended on Ascension Day. And in verse 12, they return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem. It's a Sabbath day's journey, and I had to figure out what's a Sabbath day's journey. You know, for those of you who don't know Jewish customs, on the Sabbath, they're only allowed to do certain things. And and many things are, are, are so traditional that they really aren't biblical. But on the Sabbath day, they were allowed to walk a certain distance, and a Sabbath day's journey is how they describe the distance. It was a little over half a mile from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. Actually, 0.6 miles. And they were walking back. And can you imagine how quiet that walk was? Can you imagine? Jesus has just gone up into heaven. The angels are standing there saying, why are you looking up? He told you he's coming back, but he has to go now. Your job is to spread the kingdom. And they're quietly walking back. And in verse 13, it says, And when they had entered, they went into the upper room. Now, you remember, they were hiding because they were the guys at the police and everybody from the, uh, um, yeah, from the high priests were after. So they were hiding. So they went back into the upper room and where they were staying. And it lists who was there. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. These all continued in one, in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. Don't let anyone ever tell you there were no women that followed Jesus. Someday I'm going to preach on all the women that followed Jesus. But I love it that Matthew, and, and that Luke says, this is written by Luke, Luke says, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. You see, James, in the uh, 1 Corinthians um, 115, I think, 515, 7, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, we don't have to look it up, Jesus appeared to his brother James after he died, and he turned his world upside down. Before that, they thought this Jesus was a kooky thing. They couldn't understand. And yet his brothers were there on that ascension day. So Mary's there, and this is the last time she's mentioned in the book. Because the rest that you find out about her, you have to read in history books and things that people have written about her. You know, here's a mother who saw her son crucified, saw him raised from the dead, knew his life, and then she also saw two more of her sons martyred for the cause that Jesus came. She had seen a lot of heartache, and and yet it was joy in her heart. I don't know how you mothers feel, but when your sons come to Jesus or your daughters come to Jesus, it's so exciting. 
You know, she had these sons who didn't even believe Jesus was the son of God until after he died. And then she's got her family being, just giving their life totally for the cause of Jesus. By the way, James was stoned to death like, like Stephen. And Judas, Judah, his name is Jude, but it was really Judas, he was also martyred around 65 A.D. They spread the gospel everywhere they went. So when you look at the history of, of everything that happened, I would say Mary was a woman full of courage, hope, and willingness to submit to whatever God had for her. Like I said, she had chutzpah. And I don't believe the pictures of Mary that we see on the on everywhere, I just don't think that was like her at all. Because they kind of show her like this pious, quiet woman. I bet she was exuberant, life-changing, telling the stories of her life everywhere she went. And she was such a part of what happened. Do you know when Jesus was 12 years old and you go read that when they went into the temple, she was the one who said to him, how dare you stay behind and cross us? He was gone for three days. Now, you know, my grandson, and they're off with uh, Adler's grandma, the other grandmother this morning. He's 12 years old. I know his mom. You may see her sit here quietly. If he would ever leave for three days and wouldn't tell her where he was, there would be a lot to pay in that household. <laughs> Mary was that kind of mom. She wanted to over, take care of and be over her children all the time. So she scolded. You go read that. It's in Luke 2, verse 41. You can look that up on your own time. She was a mother to admire. She raised her children without a husband most of those years. And she was like so special. But didn't you ever wonder why was she chosen to be the one to bear the son of Jesus, the son of God, Jesus? I've often wondered that. You know, there must have been at least another 100,000 women in that era that could have been that person, but God chose Mary. The word of God says Mary was highly favored. And this morning we're going to look at how do you walk in the favor of God? How do you have such favor with God that of all the women, he sees you and picks you out? Of all the men, he sees you and picks you out. It's in Luke 1, 26 to 31. And this may sound like the Christmas story, but I want you to hear this as a Mother's Day story. This is when the angel came to Mary. And now in the sixth month, this was the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, I pray that God speaks to you like this. Rejoice, rejoice. Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. Why is he saying, blessed am I? Why am I favored among women? And considered what manner of greeting this was. And then the angel Gabriel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall be called Jesus. She found favor with God. How did Mary find favor with God? How do we find favor with God? How do we begin to walk in that favor? See, favor is received by faith. Favor is like all the other gifts of God. But when you have it, you have to utilize it. So there's so many things you have in your life from God and you just aren't using it yet. Favor is given to us when we believe and walk in it. Faith in the promises that God has given us and that he's faithful to perform it. Favor is a benefit for believers. See, if you're sitting here this morning, you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Favor belongs to you. It's a gift for believers, not for those that don't know Jesus. 
God set this plan up a long time ago. And if you study God's word and spend time with him, you will find that even if you have a good life, favor brings more into your life than you could ever, ever imagine. One of my favorite scriptures is Hebrews 11.6. And we're going to read that one. And we're going to see that one together. You see, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's not hard to please God. It's impossible. You have to believe that all the things that God has given us are for you. Not for the person next to you. Look at yourself. That, this is for me. Point at yourself. This is for me. Favor is for me. It will change your life. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you know God wants to reward you? I love that verse. Oh, I love God. I know God. But did you know he wants to reward you? He wants to give you favor in your life. That wherever you go, people notice you. There's something different about you. They, God wants us to believe that he is a rewarder. See, every mother and father in this room, every person in this room, wants to give their children everything they could possibly give them. That's just how we're made. But we're made just like our daddy. So just how you want to give things to your kids, that's how God wants to give things to you. And lots of times I hear people say, well, yeah, I know God wants to give me things, but, but, and the minute they say but, I know they don't believe that he could give it to them. You see, this is what we have to know this morning. He's a rewarder of gifts for you. He wants to bless you. You know, for years and and eons, people have been studying the fact that why did God choose Mary? The favor that was on her was so unbelievable. She, you know, and when you read, I tell you what, when you read the 38th chapter, uh, sorry, sorry, the first chapter, the 38th verse of that part where the angel came. I, I want, Roger, can you put that up, Luke 1, 38? When you read this, I want you to ask yourself, is this how I would have answered the angel? You see, when God chose Mary, he already knew her heart. She was favored because she loved the Lord. And when the angel said, you're going to have a son, and you're going to bear him, and his name is Jesus, she said, behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel left. Now, I don't know about you, but we are strange in this culture that we live in the United States. I'll bet you most of us would have said, now, wait a minute. Uh, are you, you sure you got the right person here? I started arguing with an angel. Come on. Come on. This is how we are today. We want to do it our way. We got our own plans. This doesn't, I'm sorry, this doesn't fit into my plans. I already got my gown. I already had the caterer. We know who's doing the wine. And God says, you're going to have a baby. How many of us would say, okay, God, be it unto me as you said. See, Mary had such a heart for the Father. I'm going to give you four things this morning that will give you a way to walk in the favor of God. And these four things are seen in Mary's story. Number one, she had a willingness to totally submit to the word of God. Totally submit. See, submission means yielding to someone that's greater than you are. The yielding. And here's the word nobody likes to hear. Submission is obedience. It's obedience to what God says. Obedience 24-7. You know, I, I think the, my husband years ago, I, was in a lot, I did a lot of marketing and sales over the years, and he used to say, the downfall of this world is marketing. And, of course, at that time I was doing a lot of it, so I didn't agree. But now I'm beginning to think the downfall of this society is what you see on TV. 
the marketing and the things that teach us, you're worth it. You are everything. You don't need God. You know, the, the advertisements of just do it because it feels good. You see, if we don't listen to what our heart says and what God's saying, we're going to get caught up in that system of I'm, I'm perfect the way I am. You know, I, I, can't, I can't get over some of the things that I hear on a day-to-day basis on some of the evening uh, news shows. And I, I look at them, I go like, where have we come? Where have we come? You know, that the fact that people would just walk over to a police officer and shoot him right in his face? Well, uh, well I was wronged. I had the right to do that. That's not submission to authority. There's so much happening. See, obedience and submission have become like bad words in our society. But Mary was willing to submit just to give up all of her own desires, her own plans, and willing to do what God wants. You know, the opposite of obedience is rebellion. And you, you know, when you think about that in relationship to our teenagers, they rebel because they don't want to do the follow the rules of the house. And rebellion, according to the Bible, is witchcraft, manipulation. It's not of God. You see, children today think, well, I have rights. I can do what I want. And parents say, yes, you do have rights. But while you're in my house, you follow my rules. That's what we need our parents to do today. To keep the children in submission to the parents. What we do, what we do really matters. People try to tell you, oh, it's okay, you can just do it. What we do really matters. Submission is the condition of being submitted to someone greater than us. Mary submitted to God's plans Trusted totally in God, no matter the cost. She had a lot of embarrassment because she'd submitted to God. See, walking in favor requires submission to God's will. It requires obedience to God's will. And favor, you can write this one down, is a reward for obedience. When you are obedient, favor comes to you automatically. When God blesses you and gives you something and says, do this, the favor of God just falls on you. Isaiah 119 says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. If you want God to increase favor in your life, then have a lifestyle that's pleasing to him. Follow God's plan for your life. Let him take control over your life. Love God, love others. Love is the number one thing. Obedience is doing everything God commands you to do regardless of the cost. And let me tell you this, promotion always follows obedience. And I'll tell you this too. One of the things I really believe is when you are obedient to what God tells you, it's you showing him how much you love him. Let me say that again. Because when you really love someone, you want to do what pleases them. And we have a lot of Christians today who still want to live the lifestyle they live away from the will of God. But they come to Sunday and church and say, I love God. I'm still going to do it my way. See, obedience is letting God be God in your life and letting him take everything over. You need to rely totally on the Lord and be obedient. Amen. And you know what? The word of God says obedience is the only thing God requires. It will launch you in the new levels of favor. So number one to get more uh, walk in favor of God is willing to submit totally to God's word in your life. Number two, total surrender. See, Mary said, I totally, whatever. 
You see, you're saying to me, well, what's the difference between submitting and surrender? Well, I had to look that up because I thought they were the same, but they're not. You see, submitting means you're doing it because you have to. It's part of what you know. Surrender means, God, whatever. Remember, (laughs) I think this is kind of interesting, and I'll throw this in for a side story. Mary knew what happened to her cousin's husband, Zachariah, when the angel came to him and said, your wife's going to get pregnant. Now, how many of you remember what happened? He became mute when he defied the angel. She knew that because she, not, she kept in contact with her cousin. And she was pregnant. She was not pregnant until Mary was... Uh, Elizabeth was six months pregnant, so she knew that all those times, during that time, Zachariah couldn't speak. So I don't know about you, but if I knew that story, that my cousin, husband couldn't speak, and an angel come tell me I'm having a baby, I go, well, yeah, (laughs) go right ahead. (laughs) Don't forget, women couldn't go nine months without speaking. (laughs) So you have to understand, that's the submitted part. You see, she knew, she knew what was happening. So she submitted, but besides that, she surrendered. You see, there's a difference. Surrender is just, okay, God. You know, when she said yes to the angel, she had no idea that she would see her son on the cross, that two of her other boys would be martyred. She had no idea. But she said, be it unto me, as the Lord says. That's total surrender. So number two is total surrender because you want to. See, submission, that's because you're supposed to. Surrender is because you want to. To fully surrender and let God have his way brings increased favor into your life. To be blessed and highly favored suggests that she was willing and open to live her life just as God chose. Total surrender to him. Sometimes total surrender has a cost. So we know number one is submit to God. Number two is surrender to God. Number three, and this is one that I really want you to remember because this is very important. Confess every day in your life, I have favor of God. Just walk around. I'll tell you what, it works. If you've never done this, start today. I, I, over the years, had very important positions with CEOs, and I'd have a lot of major meetings where I'd walk into a meeting of 12 CEOs, and I'd be the only woman in the room. And and that was always a challenge. I'm not going to go there, but you can imagine. But I'd walk through that door and say, I have favor have favor with these men. The ideas and the plans that God has given me to, to, to bring forward, they're going to receive them because I walk in favor. And 99% of the time, I had such favor in every meeting I went into. You can claim that favor in the grocery store. You see all these people in line and all of a sudden you go like, oh my gosh, I've got to get out of here. There's 12 people on this line, 13. And then, okay, I have favor with God. And all of a sudden the clerk over here opens up and says, next please. How many it happens to you? Come on. That's the favor of God. And as you recognize God's favor on your life and as you continue to say, thank you God for the favor on my life, it increases. You've got to start speaking what you want. And you just will be surprised. You see, favor is better than money. Now some of you are going like, well, give me the money. No, give me the favor. Because favor brings money into your life. One day in his house is more favor than a thousand elsewhere. One day. Money cannot buy you favor, but favor can bring you money. Favor will show up in your life when you associate with the right people. Now, I don't know why I'm supposed to teach this because I could have taught 30 other reasons and things you should do to bring favor, but the Lord said, tell them about who they associate with. If you are anyone in your life who's off track, you need to get right with that. You see, because if you want to be a success in life, you need to get around the people who are already doing the successful things. Favor follows you when you follow the right people. 
Favor is God's I'm in you attitude. Favor is saying, draws to you what God has for you, and it's all good. God wants you to walk in favor. You know, it's just like electricity. When you walk in your house, there's no lights on because you turned them off when you left. But has the electricity left the house? It's still there. Favor is with you as a believer all the time. You got to turn on the switch. You got to declare it. You got to say, I walk in favor because I am a child of God. And things start changing in your life, and you will wonder, wow, I've seen this so many times. And favor is one of those things that will overtake you. You will be saying, like Ron did, wow, that close to my head. You see, because God has a plan for you, and it's all good. Favor from God is like turning that switch on of electricity. God wants you to walk in favor. He wants you to tap into that. So here's number three. Confess favor every day of your life and believe God will do what he said he would do in your life. The writer of Psalm 119 says, The Lord is my possession. I promise to do what you have said. I sought your favor with my whole heart, and you had mercy on me according to your word. I have one more scripture. And this is the one I confess all the time. It's Psalm 512. I'm going to let Roger put that out for us. David was a man who God said, a man after my own heart. David wrote this. We need to walk with the shield of favor around us that protects us. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. How many righteous do we have here this morning? You see, you're already blessed. People say to me all the time, be blessed. I go like, yeah, I am. Thank you. You see, you are already blessed because God said, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous and you'll bless them with favor. You will surround him as a shield. I can't tell you how many times someone has come to me for counsel and had to go in a situation with a, a police situation or a family situation and I said just pray a shield of favor around yourself you see when that favor is around you and people come close to you they immediately change their attitude now some of you are saying I never tried that try it because the favor of the righteous is around you and people are drawn to you and they don't know why it's because of the God in you This is what Mary shows us. She was willing to take the shame, the pain, the hurt, whatever would come her way, just to please God. You see, sometimes God will ask you to do things that are really strange. Ask Noah. He was told to build an ark. It never had rained before. It wasn't like the last couple weeks that we had a rain. And he starts building the ark. You know how many people told him he was crazy? But the favor of God. Do you know that if, oh man, you got to hear this. If Noah wouldn't have built the ark, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Eight people were saved in that ark. Because everybody that laughed at him didn't make it. Sometime when God tells you to do something and it seems like it's really out there, you got to just step into it. Jonah, I can just list them all. Sometimes God's ideas are weird to us, but perfect for him. Step into what God has. So we got number one, submit. Number two, surrender. Number three, declare. And number four, oh, you got to hear this. Favor is part of who you are because you carry the presence of God. Mary carried the baby. She was highly favored. You carry the Holy Spirit. 
the spirit of the baby. You are precious to God. Number four is, I'll repeat it again. Favor is part of who you are because you carry the presence of God. If you remember this, it doesn't matter what's going on in your household, what's going on at your job, what's going on in the family. You are the presence of God in that situation. You are covered with the love of God. Favor isn't found by a formula. It's just by being in surrender, submission, speaking it, and living it. We need to lift our expectations and really think about who we are. Just like Mary, believe that God wants to bless you. Believe that everything about you is good and his plans are perfect. Favor in your life will increase just as it did in Jesus. You know, the word of God says Jesus grew in favor with God and man. You see, not only do you need to grow in favor with God, you need to grow in favor with man, and that's how you do it, by declaring that I carry the favor of God wherever I go. Now, if you're here this morning and you would desire that favor to flood over your life, I'm going to pray for you. I want you all to stand up. I'm going to pray favor over your lives. I'm going to bless you with this word. You know, people... Let me just say this while you're stretching a little bit. People are, and I know Beth Ann does this. When I say, how are you doing? I hear this. I'm blessed and highly favored. I don't mind if you say that, but say it that you know it. It's not a cliche. Oh, by his stripes I'm healed, but I have pain. No, you've got to believe what comes out of your mouth. And if you know and you heard the word this morning, you know you are blessed And you are highly favored. And then when you say that, you just say, and I carry the presence. You see, that's what makes the difference in our lives. You carry his presence. Now, Father God, help us to change our mindset, to accept your favor in our lives. We trust in your word. We submit. And we surrender to your will. We believe for your favor to flow in every area of our lives. In our families, in our homes, at our workplaces, in our church life, wherever we go, Lord. And Father God, I thank you for answering the desires of their heart. Putting that shield of favor around them. And Lord, I ask this week that you surprise them as they walk into a situation that your favor overflows in their life and that they stop and say, wow, that was the favor of God. Let them acknowledge, Lord, that you are with them every minute of every day and that you are a wonderful, faithful Father who wants to reward them. Now bless them, keep them safe, Lord God. I bless them in your name. Have your face shine upon them this week and protect them in everywhere, every way, everywhere they go. We bless them now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now, if there's anyone here who has never accepted Jesus, don't go home without doing that. We'll be up here. I'd like the elders to come up with me and pray. I know there's a couple people that have asked for prayer.